welcome to the CSO Spice Talk. Today's topic is data fabric. I have the pleasure of hosting Beati uh, Porst. She is the director of product management of data fabric at IBM. I'm so excited about having her on my podcast, not only because she is the first female thought leader on my podcast, but also the depth of knowledge around data fabric she's going to bring to this conversation. First, let's have Beate introduce herself. Hey, thank you, Han, uh, for having me here today and, you know, really um, give my perspective on data fabric. Uh, um, I am, as you said, uh, uh, being responsible right now for data fabric at IBM from a product management perspective. Um, I actually come with quite a lot of background in uh, data management. I led the uh, data integration portfolio, um, data quality portfolio, and data governance. So a lot of these very essential components that now make up uh, a data fabric architecture. So for me, this is a very, uh, it's a very good um, a transit, not only transition, but something that is of you know my passion from a from a background perspective. That's awesome. That's why we are having you here today. So I actually came across a uh, report right from Statista recently. They predict that by twenty twenty five there are going to be thirty point nine billion devices, compared to thirteen point nine billion we use today. So how will corporate environment manage all that data, right? And I think about, do you think the data fabric will be a solution winning the battle against data deluge, right? But what is, that started off with, what is really data fabric? Can you give an example of a use case? Uh, yeah, so when we, when we think about a data fabric, it is foremost in a design or architecture. Um, if we look a little bit um, what happened in the last uh, years, we have always seen data goals, but the amount of data goals in recent years is just um, uh, uh, tremendous. And, and uh, there is a second trend, which is the move to um, bring applications to the cloud. So what uh, most enterprises end up with is an, an, an architecture across the entire enterprise where uh, data is so dispersed across these different enterprises points. Uh, and then you bring a good point about devices. So now we add these devices to it, the landscape becomes more and more complex. In the past, we typically took the approach and saying bring every uh, element into a single data hub or a data lake. Um, but with these data growth and the complexity involved and egress cost out of cloud environments, this isn't going to work. So we um, started to think of uh, how can we do things more uh, differently, more intelligent um, to connect these different endpoints. So literally connecting cons um, uh, producers of data with consumers of data without always having a middle hub in between. And that's what we um, think of as a data fabric. It's not just that you connect these endpoints, it is to uh, surround it with governance. Um, so how do you ensure that the data that eventually is being consumed um, can be trusted and is also maintaining secure? So we deal with a lot of sensitive information here. So we don't, we don't just want to open up all the data sources. We want to make this uh, connecting of consumers to producers of data um, in, a, in a secure form. Wow, that's uh, one of the best uh... Uh, explanation of data fabric I've ever heard, right? So thank you. I heard a, you know, qu quite a bit, you know, buzz about, quite a bit buzz about IBM Cloud Pack recently. So where did IBM first start thinking about a data fabric? Why, why does it really matter? Uh, yeah, so it's not so that IBM just, you know, um, it, it, uh, hopped on and on, on a, a trendy bandwagon here. So in fact, uh, when I uh, took the position of data fabric, I was like, wow, data fabric for me goes actually back, um, you know, almost eight years. Um, the, um, we, we used to have, um, um, uh, IBM historically has a um, strong background in data management always, not just from a database perspective, but really from the end-to-end -end data pipeline. Mm -hmm. And so it uh, it has always been in, in IBM's um, genes almost to say, how can we make this process simpler for our users? 
And uh, so we started actually to think about this kind of data fabric paradigm um, almost back eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you look at some of the analysts who also started to think about data fabric very early on, uh, for, I would name Forrester here, who actually ran uh, a wave uh, as early as I believe 2018 or 17, mm -hmm. um, initially more on a, on a um, data hub basis. They called it um, big data uh, fabric at the time. Uh, and then transition to a more enterprise one, recognizing the pattern that data shouldn't be just in a single hub. So to, to answer your question for IBM, working on this kind of data fabric style architecture is something that IBM has been doing for quite a long time. We don't necessarily we're going all buzz about this in, in calling it data fabric, but um, we certainly provided a platform uh, that connects these uh, steps in a data pipeline and tightly integrated it and tried uh, and and automated it for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, that's uh, encouraging to hear because, as you mentioned earlier, as more data is generated or the applications for data expand, business requirements and external factors such as governance or demand for new approaches to address growing complexity. For years, right, you, you know, these businesses of all sizes and types have battled data silos. And uh, so is, what about the size of the enterprise, right? Is that uh, a data fabric useful for different size, a larger size of business versus smaller one? Does the size really matter? I would not say that size directly matters uh, because you can be a very small corporation and yet have a lot of data. Mm -hmm. uh, dispersed data. Um, typically, um, uh, we see more patterns where larger organizations who grew through mergers and acquisition or a multinational organization have more of these situations. But size in itself is not the definitive uh, factor. Um, so I would more say if I if I am an organization who has this situation being having grown um, um, uh, through these mergers and acquisition, which often end ended up having siloed data. You, you can't um, um, bringing different data appli or applications together after you acquire someone is uh, highly complex. And often these systems remain in place for many, many years. Uh, also, we see different lines of business making their own IT decision of where are they hosting their um, applications and systems. Or even if things are decided on an enterprise level, there are decisions to ha maybe have a CRM system here and you know an ERP system here and a data warehouse there. So you end up having three different environments hosted or maintained on perhaps different cloud environments or on-premise. So that's really more the, the definition of what, where is it, um, um, where does uh, data fabric come in? It is, you know, the complexity of an IT landscape. But I think even if you are um, smaller and starting off, uh, uh, starting off with the mindset of uh, a data fabric architecture will help you as you go, because then you don't have to refactor everything. So I think for me, I would I would say it's it's literally for any organization. That makes total sense to me. How do you know uh, data fabric is not a fad, right? I mean, we talk about networks or Pokemon, where are they today? So, <laughs> you know, is that, or is it tech approach, right? You talk about evolve, but where are we gonna be 10 years from now? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so uh, is it, a I think um, these short lived trends come if uh, specifically if it's just uh, being promoted by a single vendor or so, and no one adopts this. This isn't being promoted by a single vendor. And um, this, if you, in fact, if you look at what, um, what happens, I see more and more vendors coming in and, and promoting their solutions as data fabric. So that's a clear trend, this is not just a fad. This is not just, you know, going away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and and uh, it's actually more, you know, it came much more that leading analysts 
uh, got inquiries from uh, their clients saying, hey, we have these problems and uh, we are uh, we, we see issues in us um, really utilizing the entire data pool. Um, we have more and more data that we um, that's really dark data or you know not being used for our analytic processes or operations and so on. And and um, and and they, they started to define what is what we really consider a data fabric architecture. Uh, so to me, it's it's absolutely not a fact. It, it's going to stay. Now the question is, um, your, to your second question, um, what will we see in ten years from now? Ten years in IT is a very very long time. Uh, if I look back at my twenty years in data management here, I have seen um, different trends coming up. Um, uh, you know, when I started off, it was all about data warehousing. Um, and even data virtualization was already there at the time. And then we moved into the big data, data lake area. Mm -hmm. um, and and uh, so I think we will see data fabric in 10 years being called maybe something different as technology progresses. Uh, but I think this is just the nature of IT, that we progress, that we know or have better technology to do things differently. So if it in 10 years is called something differently and evolved, and then it's actually a good sign that we had data fabric. We know we got value out of it, and now we evolve it to something new. That is um, in every uh, technology, we see evolutions happening. And, and so this would be just another uh, phase in, in moving forward. Yeah, I, I would uh, echo what you just said there, Beati. Uh, what about from job perspective? Do you anticipate to see chief data fabric officer in the future? And, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of new job titles popped up, you know, within the past five years. What do you think, you know, from job perspective? Yeah, if we will see a chief data fabric officer, um, I don't know. I mean, a chief data officer is kind of this encompassing super umbrella on, on top of it. I certainly, when it comes to uh, a, um, an IT role, uh, well, it could be both, right? Um, data yeah. fabric is both. It's in IT and in the business side. Um, uh, specifically on an enterprise architecture level, I could definitely see this being a role saying, you know, what is our, because this, this data fabric really sits in the middle. Uh, it, it, I could see it as a role there. Um, if uh, a chief data officer would assume responsibility to say, I'm also really making sure that the way how we approach data is so that it follows a data fabric architecture um, or we break it further down. I don't know. I'm not sure about this one, but definitely from an architecture perspective, I could, I, I definitely would see that we see more uh, 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 um, titles in that also in product management. I saw myself director of data fabric, so I'm very proud of it. And I've seen some of my colleagues also being now called data fabric product managers. So yes, I think we do see this title. Yeah, it's such a cross section of both business and IT, right? Job responsibilities, if you think about it. And it's so crucial, not only for people in this function to understand the technology, but also be able to speak the business language, articulate to uh, make sure all the business you know, uh, requirements are taken into consideration when you design the uh, data structure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, for those who are new, right, they would, if they want to consider leveraging data fabric to build scalable growth, what kind of advice would you give it to them? Um, I think the, um, the advice is uh, A, to not try to boil the ocean. There's always data fabric we're looking end to end is a pretty significant part of an architect um, of the overall enterprise architecture so there's always a risk if i started that i start too big um, because a um, 
a, a, a CDO or a CTO, whoever is involved in this, you want to show success to the business. Uh, and so look, what is important here is to identify um, where is my biggest gap in, in this architecture to bring in more of a data fabric notion? Am I lacking these, this governance, this knowledge of where my data is? And um, then I would start with this, which is typically all what we recommend here. Start with um, mapping your landscape, bringing in this, this knowledge part, which then can be used by the, by the business. You don't have to start with trying to do this for the entire enterprise. Start with a portion of and, and grow. Um, uh, uh, so th that would be certainly my strongest uh, advice here. In, in this um, um, picking the right um, uh, picking the right size of it, also picking a specific uh, business problem you have, uh, and 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 not just come in and and said, oh, data fabric is 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 trendy. Let's hop on on this trend, but saying, you know, where um, I want to solve, you know, I want to become better in my customer three hundred and sixty as an example, which is a very classical use case. Um, what knowledge do I have today about my customer? Where, which data sources am I not just bringing in, and why? And then uh, approaching this. There is, um, yeah, we we often um, uh, one of the classical problems we have, um, specifically on the ML side, is this. Uh, extended period of projects because of the data acquisition time. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's my problem, then I could look at what causes this is. Um, is, my, um, is it due to the way how we bring data to these, this kind of community? And, and can I perhaps utilize uh, different access technology here to um, complement my current architecture. So, so typically we, we come in and say, you know, don't do a rip, rip and replace. Um, more looking at where are the weak points and complement with things that are leading more to a data fabric style architecture. Uh, and one last um, thought is um, if you do come in and said, you know, I, I want to do best of breed and everything, Think of it also from a process people perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I often bring the analogy, or you know, if you if you have the best technology, that doesn't make you successful, right? Uh, I, I often give a comparison into if you were to buy the most modern fleet of planes, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, a Dreamliner or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, and and uh, think now that I am a successful airline. No, that doesn't make you a successful airline. Mm -hmm. What makes you a successful airline is if you know how to use this modern technology, how to turn these airplanes around at an airport and all these things combined. And the same is true for a uh, data fabric. The data fabric is mostly the technology side. So you have to complement it with the people process side. So you have to have the buy-in, you have to have um, uh, uh, know how to actually bring these technology into your organization. That's such a profound point, uh, Biati, because when it comes to you know, innovation or digital transformation, 20% of that is technology, right? 80% is what we do with yeah. the technology and also the psychological management, right? And making sure the change management is in place. We have process and people to take that into consideration. Yeah. So I'm really grateful for having you here just in a short term time. I've learned a ton from this conversation and uh, you know, I can't wait to invite you back to my podcast. We, as a matter of fact, three more podcast with IBM coming up, right? We're going to talk about AI trustworthiness, talk about data privacy, and also the AI in enterprise. So uh, thank you for being here with us today. And I want the audience to all stay bold, stay fearless, and stay grateful. Have a wonderful day.